Okay, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to be moving on now to our next plenary session, the title of which is Success at COP26. I'm sure, as you all know, world leaders will be gathering at the end of this year in Glasgow, in Scotland, which is still just about part of the UK. It's a city which is famous and occasionally infamous for its pubs and bars, and it is therefore very tempting to say that come December, those leaders will be drinking in a very particular bar indeed, namely the Last Chance Saloon. That's where we'll be. It's arguably our best and last chance of turning down the dial on climate catastrophe. Now, you may think that's too gloomy, that we should be more excited about solutions. Perhaps so. But what are the likely prospects for success at COP26? If anyone can tell us, it's our next panel. Our panel includes Mr. Ivo de Boer, advisor and consultant on international environmental policy, former executive secretary of the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change, Ms. Brigitte Collet, who is French ambassador for climate, Mr. Vincenzo De Luca, ambassador of Italy to India, and Professor Nick Stern, a member of the COP26 advisory board and one of the most influential economists on climate change. And as chair, we welcome Ambassador Ajay Malhotra, Distinguished Fellow at Terry. So please join me in welcoming our panelists to the days. A very warm welcome to everyone to this high-level panel discussion uh, of the WSDS uh, 2020 uh, plenary being hosted by Terry in New Delhi, entitled Success at COP26 with a question mark. Uh, I'm Ambassador Ajay Malhotra, Distinguished Fellow with Terry. And let me open our session by stating that uh, for the developing world in particular, we look towards uh, securing sustainable development and tackling climate change. And these are both tremendously important and interlinked challenges. And in late 2015, when you had um, the adoption of, uh, the adoption unanimously of Agenda, uh, 2030 with its 17 SDGs, and soon thereafter, the, the Paris Climate Change Agreement with its nationally determined contributions, uh, we had, the world had put in place very ambitious frameworks for meeting sustainable development objectives while limiting global temperature rise to well below 2 degrees Celsius and, if possible, 1.5 degrees. Over the last year, we've had uh, warnings from scientists. So we have seen a rush of natural disasters fueled by climate change, extensive forest fires in the Amazon, the worst ever bushfires in Australia, millions of acres burned, thousands of homes destroyed, um, many innocent lives lost, many urban centers elsewhere being flooded, Jakarta, for example, accelerated melting of glaciers, um, and the ice packs at the poles. One very eminent uh, scientist even saying that by the year 2022, we may have no uh, ice year round uh, in the Arctic. And so these are things um, of concern. Uh, clearly urgent climate action is needed. And multilateral climate negotiations, though slow um, and sometimes maybe even a bit removed from reality to the outside world looking at them, they are our best hope for coordinated global action uh, to mitigate and adapt to climate change. So very briefly on the last COP and then we look ahead. I think I was just thinking about it as we came up. Uh, COP 25, uh, some, I don't think we'd call it a complete failure, but if it was a bad COP, our hope is from that bad COP, good COP analogy, that COP26, hopefully, will be a good COP out oh, there. <laughs> uh, the reality is, and there's no point sugarcoating that, the reality is it achieved much less than what the people and planet needed to do to avoid catastrophic climate change in the 21st century. Spain and Chile certainly hosted it very efficiently. That is not in doubt. And despite the short notice, something to be congratulated about. And you reached agreements on many of the remaining parts of the rule book for the implementation of the Paris Agreement. 
but the Madrid meeting failed to raise the anticipated enhanced commitments towards ambition. Um, I think everyone acknowledges that. Um, the Secretary General said as much. Uh, even the uh, president of COP25 um, uh, in her closing statement noted that. So, uh, and more than that, no consensus was reached over Article 6 of the Paris Agreement, uh, which was very dis disappointing. The issue here being of what to do with trading uh, of emission permits and credits. So this issue remains unresolved as we move to COP26 in Glasgow. Uh, we need to figure out how to crystallize the details on operationalizing carbon markets and trading. And other crucial um, uh, discussion before us pertains to linking it with the last session, long-term strategies, especially in sectors such as electricity and beyond, uh, and how we can put together the funding and technology uh, so sorely needed, and uh, the capacity building, which is of great interest to developing countries. So we certainly need effective leadership, and we have a very distinguished panel today. I would request uh, that as we discuss the issues, uh, we be forward-looking, look at COP26, uh, and see how we can generate success out there. And our discussion may kindly revolve around the following questions. What does success at COP26 entail? Uh, what needs to be done differently at the next COP to neutralize this trust deficit which has emerged? Uh, I won't want to name countries, but you know, four or five countries, and the action or the lack of action on Article 6, for example. How can other stakeholders beyond governments more effectively brought into the, into the fight against climate change? Uh, how can youth be involved in the designing and the outcomes of uh, COP26? They are already involved, whether we like it or not. But how we can draw, draw them into the processes that are uh, underway? And I would say very important from a developing country viewpoint, in addition, how can governments, businesses, and other stakeholders be brought into the issue of finance and technology mobilization, and how can COP26 help with this? I'll invite statements of uh, six, seven minutes each from each of our four distinguished speakers, and we'll do so in the order in which they are listed. Uh, we would have thereafter about 20 minutes for Q and A's, and time permitting, there would be two minutes each for closing comments. So my first speaker would be Mr. Ivo Dubois, uh, advisor and consultant on international environmental policy. You all know him as the executive secretary of the UNFCCC from 2006 to 2010. He was thereafter with KPMG for some time, for two years, and then Director General of the Global Green Growth Institute in Seoul. You are now with us, and you have the floor, sir. Well, thank you very much, Ajay, um, for that introduction. It's a great pleasure for me to be here. Um, this thing, the WSDS, used to be called the, the DSDS, the Delhi Sustainable Development Summit, and I went to every one of those. And then it was replaced by the WSDS, the World Sustainable Development Summit. And I've been to every one of those and enjoyed every one of those. So I haven't quite worked out the numbers, but I think I'm at SDS 26 talking about COP 26, maybe. Um, it's always fascinating to try and think what, um, what your fellow panelists are going to come up with in terms of the success criteria for COP26, the next important climate change conference that's, um, that's coming our way. Um, I hope that they're going to say, and I'm confident that, that they're going to say, that in Paris, another conference of the parties, uh, a very important agreement was reached, which basically obliges countries to up the level of ambition um, when we meet at COP26. Uh, and I'm sure that some of my fellow panelists are going to say that we really need to deliver on that increase of ambition. Why? Because I hope that other panelists are going to say that we're so close to the turning point um, where we lose the ability to keep the impacts of climate change under control that we absolutely have to uh, reach an agreement on an increased level of ambition uh, at this COP. And in that context, I hope that some of my fellow panelists are going to say that in order to achieve that political commitment, we need industrialized countries who are basically responsible for this problem to show uh, leadership in terms of reducing um, their emissions 
and, um, and providing the financial support that they've committed to, to provide to developing countries to allow them to engage. So I hope that the other panelists are going to say that and then I don't have to. Um, having said what I wasn't going to say, one of the things that, that I'm reminded of in, this, of in the context of this process is um, a saying that was misdrafted. You know, there's a great deal of drafting that happens in the context of the UNFCCC process. And um, a saying which I feel linked to climate change that has been misdrafted is the saying that where there is a will, there is a way. Because I think a much more accurate way to, to phrase that saying in a climate change context would be to say that where there is uh, a way, there is a will. Now, why do I say that? I say that because, broadly speaking, um, I think that the urgency of the climate change challenge has reached an, an almost global or a very significant uh, international recognition. So people um, around the world, helped by Greta, helped by, um, by other activists, recognize the urgency of, of acting on this issue. My sense is that a large number of, of politicians, a large number of administrators, many people in countries, while having that recognition of the urgency, don't yet understand how they can actually deliver on that thing which they feel is incredibly important. So if you were to ask me what I think is important in the context of, of COP26, the forthcoming COP, it's all of those things that I mentioned before, but it's also a much stronger focus on means of implementation, which to me, it can be divided into, into two chapters. The first chapter is everything around um, helping emerging economies and developing countries to engage on real climate action on the ground through financial and techno technological support in such a way that that action contributes to other goals that they have uh, around economic growth and poverty eradication. So I really hope that the COP in, in, uh, in Edinburgh um, is going to contribute around the means of implementation in terms of supporting governments to understand that um, where there is a will, there is also a way. And the second thing that um, I, I hope is going to happen, and, and Ajay referred to it, is that we are going to get to the point in, um, at the COP in Glasgow where the role of the private sector uh, is enabled, where we see the market-based mechanisms and the flexibility mechanisms which are in the Paris Accord uh, come alive. And the only way for those mechanisms to come alive in, in a meaningful way is if they get rid of some of the baggage in the past and really focus on an engagement of the private sector in an environmentally and, uh, and climate sensitive way that, that is truly credible. So not having heard my fellow panelists yet, I would like to agree with everything that they're going to say on the points that I just raised and hope that really this COP in, uh, in Glasgow and we have Italy the co-chair here is also going to focus on helping emergency, emerging economies act on the challenge of climate change in a way that is aligned with their ambitions on economic growth and poverty eradication. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ivo. Uh, yes, uh, raising ambition is hugely important. We have over 100 countries which have um, given assurances they would ratchet up their ambition uh, going ahead. But uh, some of the main emitters are not amongst them, and we need to see how uh, COP26 and uh, can kind of um, nudge them along in the right direction. Uh, and yes, uh, focusing on the means of implementation for, a, um, for the developing world, uh, this is hugely important. Uh, we, you are balancing environment and development and you need to know that when you are uh, shifting priorities in response to international demand, there would be some support coming away in terms of uh, funding, technology, availability, and uh, also capacity building. My next speaker would be Her Excellency uh, Madame Brigitte Collet, who since uh, 2016 is the French Ambassador for Climate Change Negotiations, Renewable Energy, and Prevention of Climate Risk. Uh, 
uh, with the Ministry of Europe and Foreign Affairs in, in France. Uh, earlier, she used to be ambassador to Ethiopia and before that to Norway, if I remember correctly. And before that, uh, with the mission in New York at about the same time as I was there. Uh, um, you have the floor, ma'am. First, let me let me say how uh, happy I am to be to be here today to participate in this uh, in this summit, and uh, also I would like to to very much uh, uh, congratulate Terry for the remarkable work uh, done by uh, by the institute. Um, I share very much the assessment you you presented regarding COP25, so I will move directly to uh, COP26. I believe that to, to reach success at COP26, we need to consolidate the four pillars of the Paris architecture as envisaged at COP21. So the four pillars are the Paris Agreement, the national commitments through the NDCs, the finance, and the mobilization of non-state actors. First, regarding the Paris Agreement, we still have to finalize uh, some guidelines to implement it fully, and notably on Article 6. I believe it is uh, possible to reach a consensus if we respect the letter and the objectives of the Paris Agreement. Second, regarding the national action plans. As was just said, 2020 must be the year of ambition if we want to meet the objectives that we agreed on in, uh, in Paris. And uh, as the IPCC reminds us on a regular basis, we need to act decisively now. We therefore need to amplify the, the movement of ambition, which was uh, launched by the UN Secretary General and by Chile last year, and uh, which led to 114 countries uh, saying that they would enhance their NDCs. And we expect also a number of long-term strategies to, to come. One very important news came towards the end of COP25 in Madrid. The EU, the European Union, decided to become carbon neutral by 2050. And the European Commission presented a comprehensive Green Deal. This uh, proposal contains, uh, regarding climate, one specific provision, which is to increase the EU greenhouse gas emission reduction target for 2030 to at least 50% towards 55% compared to the 1990 levels. And before it was anticipated that it would be 40%, but we're moving to 50-55%. But at the moment, the EU represents, is a big emitter. It represents a bit more than 9% of the emissions, but uh, its uh, share in the emissions is falling. So uh, we need all the big emitters to, to rally around this objective of ambition. And this is why the EU and its member states will uh, engage with uh, many partners, especially from the G20, to strengthen the collective effort. We will cooperate also very much with the, the most vulnerable countries, and we, we recognize that the, the SEEDs and the LDCs very often uh, lead by an example. And I was just in Bhutan, and I was very impressed by what I, I saw there. Third, the finance. We recognize it is an essential element for action, but also for trust and for solidarity. Uh, my country attaches a lot of importance to this, uh, this question of uh, mobilizing climate finance for, uh, for action. And uh, we were co-lead for the UN summit, which took place in September. At COP26, we shall um, assess where we are on the commitment of $100 billion uh, for yearly for the period 2020 to 2025. But the data for 2020 will not be available yet this year. We will have essentially 2018 figures. After having said that, we believe that based on the trends we have observed, 
uh, we should be able to meet the, the 100 billion commitment. And I can assure you that France remains totally committed to its uh, pledge for the, for the period of 2020 to 2025. Uh, for example, we decided to, to double our contribution to the GCF when we hosted the GCF replenishment last year, and we became the second contributor to the GCF. At COP26, we also must make sure that the discussion on the next collective financial goal starts on a good basis. And we should also work more on the issue of implementation of what is called Article 21C of uh, the Paris Agreement, that is the redirection of financial flows, including private, of course, towards low emission and climate resilient development. Fourth pillar, the non-state actors. It's very clear that we will never meet the Paris objectives if we don't mobilize fully uh, the local authorities, the business, the finance sector, the, the NGO, the civil society at large. And I must say that sometimes they are more innovative and ambitious than governments. And if you think about the U United States, it's uh, quite obvious. President Macron really believes that coalitions of committed actors can be uh, very powerful actors of change. And this is why he launched the One Planet Summit, first to deal with climate, but uh, extended also to the question of biodiversity and ocean. The idea is to encourage very significant actors, those which are able to set standards or trends, to work together in order to search, to reach what I would call tipping points for climate action. And to do that, we are very proud uh, that uh, we have Dr. Ajay Matur and Professor uh, Nick Stern as members of the One Planet uh, Lab. A lot of innovation is uh, coming from those, uh, those coalitions, and many initiatives are happening outside of the COP uh, framework. And here in India, it's easy to think about the International Solar Alliance. Probably in COPs, we need to better structure the action agenda to make sure that these initiatives can be presented and serve as inspiration or toolbox for all interested actors, be they governmental or non-governmental. If I, if I may, before, before concluding, uh, say a word about a very important voice, the, the voice of the, the youth. I think it's important now to, to think in terms of how can we enable them to contribute to designing the future. In Paris is currently meeting uh, a citizens' assembly, which is tasked with uh, making recommendations on our climate policy. There are 150 citizens, and amongst them there are about 15. Uh, there are 15 youths. Some of them don't even have uh, 18 years old. The, idea, the very idea is to have them contribute to um, to the, the policy of the country. To conclude, I believe that uh, success at COP26 is not only vital, but it is possible. It, it is possible if we join forces to face the common threat that uh, climate change is, and if we cooperate in the same spirit of uh, urgency and solidarity, which made the Paris Agreement possible. And I fully trust that the United Kingdom and Italy will be able to bring us together. Thank you for your attention. Uh, thank you, Madame uh, Ambassador Collet. Uh, you have uh, pointed out the four pillars, as you call them, uh, the guidelines to implement the Paris Agreement, um, raising uh, ambition, in terms of the NDCs, uh, on which, as you said, 114 have announced, and we do hope the major emitters also join in, uh, because we have to look in terms of um, emissions uh, also, not merely number of countries. On financing, I was very heartened to hear your expectation that um, the Green Climate Fund would meet the uh, 
$100 billion per annum uh, contribution in the year 2020. And I do hope the non-availability uh, non of data uh, would not prove to be a problem because I'm sure you could figure out whether that much money is actually there in the fund towards the end of uh, 2020. And well, that would be very nice because uh, it would help make a reality for many of the countries who are looking to use those funds and the technologies linked with them as they go ahead and taking the action that deserves to be taken. Uh, you mentioned about mobilizing all sectors, and yes, that is uh, uh, hugely important. The ISA is also one uh, fine and inspiring example where India and France have cooperated in moving ahead in a particular sector of renewable energy, uh, which perhaps um, can uh, motivate others in other directions too to put together groupings and uh, that can address these sort of issues as we go ahead. Uh, my next speaker would be uh, Ambassador Vincenzo Di Luca. He is an Italian ambassador to India, uh, very recently presented his credentials on the 18th of December, if I recall. Uh, and uh, uh, more than three decades of service uh, with the Italian Foreign Office, uh, uh, including in Khartoum, Tunis, Paris, and Shanghai, where you served as Consul General for the last for four years. Uh, you have the floor, I understand, uh, since uh, UK and Italy would be kind of co-hosting uh, uh, COP26, looking at uh, Glasgow, that, uh, and the special mandate given to Italy being youth. Maybe you may like to address that angle. The youth are way ahead of uh, the governments in things they want and what they hope to achieve, and it is important we draw in that energy and use it in the negotiations as we go ahead. At the floor, sir. Thank you. First of all, thank you, Ambassador uh, uh, Malotra and Terry. And yes, we are in a particular moment of the process of the fighting against climate change. I would skep be skeptical to say success, failure, complete success, complete failure. I don't think 25 has been a complete failure. This is a process. Some, sometimes we can speed up the process. Sometimes we have some slowdown, but we have to be still everybody committed to the process. And certainly, UK, Italy will do all the best. We deploy all our efforts to make a speed up of the process. But uh, we know we, which are the challenge which, which are the fields where we have to try to include everybody. Because the first approach of our presidency with UK is inclusiveness. We have to involve all the stakeholders, government, private sector. From our side, we would like very much focus as Italy on youth, young people. Friday for, Truth for Future has been a global movement. We have to take inspiration of the awareness raised by this movement, by the, the international public opinion, because unless we have a really wide social awareness, it will be difficult for government to move on. Social acceptance, social awareness, and also I would say the social impact of the process is the core of the success or the failure of the process. We know which is this, the, the challenge for the most advanced country, for emerging economies, for developing countries. But I think, as Ambassador Colette say, uh, Europe has raised its ambition in a concrete way and with a strong political commitment. This is also our first contribution to the process. We know Italy and Europe represent 9% of the total emission. If we do realize all the program, we do not succeed in having substantial reduction of the emission. But give the example, not only give the example, be committed, and I would add also promoting international partnership. 
Because what we, what we really need in climate change, in the fly fighting of, uh, against climate change, is a global partnership in terms of financial flow, financial commitment, government, but also private sector. As government, we have increased by 20% our uh, contribution to the Green Fund, Global Green Fund. France have done a lot. Europe, all the European countries as, are contributing, but it's not enough. We have to move also in the private sector, in the financial uh, organization, and uh, also, I would say, we should, uh, as Europe, certainly, promote international partnership for technology transfer. Because one of the issues in uh, fighting climate change, one of the focus of this fight is coal power plant, coal sector. We certainly know that here in India, in China, in many other countries, coal power plants represent something like 70% of the production of electricity. So there are different ways to improve even the use of coal in terms of efficiency, in terms of use of the coal. There is other possibility to introduce technology in the use of coal, for example, carbon capture and storage. There are possibility to have a transition from coal to cleaner energy, maybe not all renewable energy. I also believe that maybe a transition to through the gas could reduce the impact of all this coal production in the world. So there are, these are the real terms of the issue. How can we address this issue without an inclusiveness, without hearing all the parts and the concern, the social concern that we have in the process? Because we don't need only a commitment of the government because we have a political commitment. We have also taken into account which are the social impact in country where uh, this uh, source of energy is largely the primary source of electricity, of power, of energy. So we have to be, at the same time, ambitious, pragmatic, inclusive in the process. This is our, at least, our part as the Italian government, as an Italian country. Because we will host in Italy a global forum of all the representatives of young people from all over the world. We want to give them floor to express their commitment. They are the first uh, affected by the consequence of climate change. All the countries are affected, but the future generation is the first generation to be in, uh, in, this, uh, in this fight. So I am, am so happy to be here. We have already uh, promoted several meetings here together with UK. With India is a key partner in this process. Terry plays an important role in promoting the dialogue and trying to find the uh, sharing of position in the process of the negotiation. Negotiation is a process, will be some failure, some success, but we have to all to be committed. And I think European countries, European Union, also in the next summit we will have with India, this will be one of the focus climate change, sustainable development, and the, also the technology partnership to address the issue of the process. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Ambassador. I liked uh, many parts of what you said, but in particular, your reference to technology at the end of it. It should not get forgotten. Uh, and it's very nice to hear you speak of a program which is ambitious, pragmatic, inclusive, uh, we do know of the Green Deal for Europe, and uh, it is a step in the right direction, which we welcome, and we do hope others step forward similarly and who are placed in a way that they can help uh, move uh, our international cooperation in the right direction. We do hope that also happens. Uh, in fact, as you said about uh, the youth, uh, um, the commitment of young people to tackle Climate change um, certainly generates hope for the future. Uh, and uh, as grown-ups or 
adults or senior citizens, perhaps. <laughs> I think we do have a duty to respond to their call and to respond to it and deliver by strong and urgent action. I don't think this can be delayed any longer. And if we have to be true to Paris, this is a make or break here. Uh, with those comments, I will now uh, give the floor to our last panelist, uh, Professor Nicholas Stern. I was telling him before that uh, he needs no introduction. And if I were to give a, a, a regular sort of introduction, it would probably end by the time uh, COP26 would be over. So uh, if you don't mind, uh, just to say that, um, let me just limit it to saying that he is now, alongside other many, many important posts he holds, uh, a member of the COP26 advisory board. I'm not surprised uh, when it was announced. Uh, you have all the expertise and background to help your country deliver on that. And now that Brexit is behind you, I hope uh, you could, UK can concentrate on, uh, well, it'll be tomorrow, sorry. It's almost behind you. I hope you can concentrate um, the energies of your leadership to delivering on uh, COP26 also, which I'm sure you would. You have the floor, sir. Thank you very much. Um, uh, on Brexit, let's just note there are different views. But it will happen tomorrow night. Enough of that. Um, I'm um, delighted to be back at the uh, WSDS and with our friends at Terry and particularly, of course, Ajay Matur. Uh, I haven't quite got the record that Evo had, but I've been to many of these, uh, of these summits and I've always learned something and enjoyed myself. Secondly, it's wonderful to share this platform with Italy, France, and uh, India, and of course with uh, Evo, someone who has been deep inside um, the whole process of these uh, COPs. For all the reasons you know about, that's the right group on the panel here in India today, and it's um, uh, very well constructed, so thank you. Um, let me just say something about my role, and then I'll move fast and quickly into the substance. I do not work for Her Majesty. Um, three years in my life I did work for Her Majesty, or at least Her Majesty's government. Uh, they were enjoyable years, but they were more than a, a decade ago. Um, but uh, I am involved through the high-level advisory panel, um, as I was involved in Paris at the, uh, the Friends of the COP. Uh, in, in 21 and have been involved in the Friends of COP25 and so on over the years. But please understand that whilst I will try to describe how I understand the way in which the UK with its partner Italy is approaching this, I do not speak as, as it were, the president of the, uh, of the COP. But I am fairly close to the story. I'll describe it in my own way, if I may. Um, now, I want to describe five strands. They'll have to be headlines for shortage of time, but five strands that feed into the nationally determined contributions and the long-term strategy, which will sort of in many ways be headlines in the COP, but there are five key strands in that story. And then I, I'll say something very briefly about the fundamental underlying narrative. And the fundamental underlying narrative is that the drive to the zero carbon economy is the sustainable and inclusive growth story of the 21st century, and it's our task to make that uh, happen. Um, it would be different ways, different speeds in different countries, but the drive to net zero is the growth story of the 21st century, sustainable and uh, inclusive. So five strands. The first strand is the, this will be the net zero COP. If the world doesn't go net zero, concentrations rise. If concentrations rise, temperatures rise. Net zero is just fundamental in the physics. And uh, the question is, when? And the, the earlier you go net zero, the lower the temperature at which you stabilize. But this will be the net zero COP. More than 120 countries now have declared for net zero. Um, but of course, some of the big ones have not yet. Timing, of course, will be different for different countries. The second strand is the sectors and the technologies, um, including the financial sector. So the UK, with its partner Italy, will be working for um, 
understandings and action and programs around sectors and technologies. And actually, the discussion of technology is usually best placed if it's situated within a sector. It looks different for uh, different sectors. The financial sector of fundamental. If we can see strong progress in those areas, sector, sectors, technologies, including finance, then you have reason to believe that you can accelerate. And of course, acceleration is uh, uh, absolutely at the core of this. And the private sector, in many ways, I spent last week in Davos, in many ways, business and finance is getting out ahead of governments, and that is encouraging because progress with, uh, in the business and finance sector encourages governments to be more ambitious, and if governments are more ambitious, then the business and the finance sector is more ready to move. They feed off each other in a constructive way. So that second strand, uh, sectors, technologies, finance, private sector, very important. The third strand is the flows of finance and the 100 billion. Now, you've heard about the 100 billion. I won't add other than to say it is important that the concessional element of the 100 billion steps up. I think it's fair to say that France and the UK have been doing exactly that. The UK doubled its climate finance uh, quite recently. But it's much bigger than that 100 billion. And I say that as somebody who was directly involved uh, in, uh, in Copenhagen, which had many positives, uh, which included the 100 billion. And I was directly involved in that, of course, Evo as well. So the um, story then is the flows of finance have to be very substantial, much more than the 100 billion, and the cost of capital has to come down. So much of the story of uh, renewables and low carbon uh, is about uh, getting the right capital equipment because, of course, the sunshine and the uh, water come free, but you have to make the capital investment. The cost of capital is fundamental, so we have to move the whole financial sector, and as we do it, not only think of scale, bring down the cost of capital. Um, Nature-based, uh, I hate the word solutions, but it seems to have got stuck in the language. Nature-based solutions are a big part of this story, particularly around net zero, but also particularly as in the One Planet uh, Lab, as we should, we put um, oceans and biodiversity along with uh, with that story. So nature-based solutions, fundamental, <coughs> restoring degraded land, a big part of that, of course, plus the, uh, the forests and uh, the oceans. And the fifth strand is the importance of resilience. Climate change is with us. It's going to get worse. And we have to plan for that. And we have to plan for that now. Again, another element in the infrastructure story and the uh, coalition which India has fostered uh, for um, uh, disaster resilient infrastructure is a big part of uh, that story. So those five strands, and they feed into the nationally determined contributions and the long-term strategies. I've already argued that overarching all that should be our understanding that this is indeed the growth story of the, inclus the inclusive sustainable growth story of this century. It, strong investment now in infrastructure boosts demand in a demand-constrained world, but it also sharpens supply. In the short and medium term, we're already witnessing the beginning of a Schumpeterian story of discovery, innovation, investment, and growth. And there is no long-term high-carbon story itself destructs. This is the growth story of the 21st century. It'll look different in different places, but that opportunity and that necessity is available to us uh, all. Very quickly then, uh, to move to my conclusion, I hope that the UK is a good place for this. It has set a very early example of net zero by uh, 2050. <coughs> it has legislation, uh, the, you know, the carbon legislation in place, which is valuable, gives a, uh, a framework and some confidence. And so I think it has, I think, some legitimacy in that it's uh, grown since 1990 by around 70% and cut emissions by more than 40%, uh, and I've already referred to the climate finance. The UK has to have credibility at the table. I believe it does, and many of us will be working in the UK to try to make sure that it does and it keeps to its commitments inside government and, like myself, outside uh, government. India, with China, is the most important country in the world, and it's at the heart of what will happen to the world of the 21st century. 
uh, of course, most importantly through the development of India itself, but the way in which, also the way in which India interacts with the world. India has played a leading role in renewables. It will electrify its railways and go uh, and, and buy zero carbon electricity from its railways in five uh, years or so. India is showing uh, how to combine, and this is fundamental, development, adaptation, and mitigation. Those three things are closely interwoven. Uh, think, of, um, think of the system of root, system of, uh, root intensification for rice and other crops. That is lower cost, saves uh, energy and uh, water. That's uh, development. It's more robust against difficult weather, and if you don't flood the paddy field, you don't emit methane from the paddy field. Excuse me for an agricultural example, but I've been working for more than 45 years in one Indian village, and that's the first sort of test that I bring uh, to bear. Think also of public transport. Public transport is about development, mitigation, adaptation, and of course, it benefits poor people particularly. This is a story where the three strands are interwoven. If we set one against the other, we will be making a categorical mistake and a practical mistake, and we will undermine uh, policy. And India uh, surely is important there. So how will, uh, and China I hope, and this we must all ask uh, and encourage, and I hope that China peaks its emissions not by 2030 as promised in Paris, but by 2025, and that means within the 14th five-year plan. The 14th five-year plan is of fundamental importance in all this story, and it will be um, essentially uh, crystallized during this calendar year. And friends of China, I include myself in that, will be looking for a peaking during the 14th plan, 2021-2025. How will it be organized? Well, I know that the president of the COP, um, uh, Claire, uh, is, Claire O'Neill, is very keen to have it as transparent as possible, live streaming, so you can see what goes on inside these uh, rooms. That's very uh, important. It's very important that prime ministers and finance ministers are fundamentally involved. This is transforming the whole economy. Prime ministers, finance ministers have to be, sent, economic ministers have to be centrally involved in this. And this, this is a story which is affecting us all. So civil society, young people, as we've heard, business, all cities, <coughs> lower tiers of government, all have to be involved. And um, Ivo put it when he was talking about wills and ways, he was putting an argument I often put, and I express it slightly differently, uh, Ivo. I say that I'm enormously confident and optimistic about what we can do. We can see it now, but I worry deeply about what we will do. And it's a bit like your adjustment of the wills and the ways. But logically prior to what we will do is what uh, we can do, and we have to come together in this spirit of collaboration to transform what we can do into what we will do. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Professor Stern. I appreciate that you again highlighted the point of uh, that uh, the drive to net zero carbon growth uh, as being important, uh, hugely important, and uh, in his, I know um, after winning the election, your prime minister uh, did uh, reiterate it in uh, even his uh, electoral speech at that stage. So that's um, very nice to hear. Uh, yes, uh, funding has to go beyond 100 billion. And that was what was agreed. You have to look at now how to take it beyond 100 billion a year. So not only do we hope that it'll be the GCF will be filled with 100 billion, but looking ahead, we'll have to set new targets, which obviously would have to be more ambitious. And a very important point of uh, lowering the cost of capital, um, because otherwise I don't see how it's going to happen. Nature-based solutions, I'm very happy you brought it out. In my view, this is one uh, sector that has not really been uh, devoted enough attention to. You're going, we have put a lot of stress on uh, GHG emissions, but uh, is all of that lying out there, and I think uh, it would be very good if some very specific initiatives were taken on that. That's a personal view. And I entirely agree with what you said on China peaking its emissions in 2030. There was nothing very ambitious about that uh, 
offer when it was made under the INDCs, and now let's hope they, at that stage, if they said 2025, that would have been nice. But if they're not doing it even now, I think we've got a long way to go. Very good to know about the transparency that you envisage, and that finance ministers would be involved. I think one nice thing about uh, the meeting in Madrid was the first meeting that you had of finance ministers, because without having them on board, all of this discussion, uh, no matter, will not really get very far. So that's very good to hear, and we hope that it succeeds. I would now open the floor for a quick Q&A. We don't have too much time, so please be brief. Uh, identify yourselves and your organization, and uh, make it a question rather than a comment, if that's possible. You have the floor, sir. And to whom do you want to address it to? Also, it if you can say. To all the delegate, it's a very simple question. I am H.S. Sharma, oldest living IITN of India, 80 year old, B.Tech from IIT Bombay first batch, M.Tech from Imperial College, London. My question is very simple. Who will control Trump and Kim? They are exploding nuke bombs without any knowledge. Okay. They do not know ABCD of climate change, at least Trump doesn't know ABC. Okay, anyway, that's a good question. My question is very simple to you. We have lived, to all of you, on this earth. Human being has lived for thousands of years. Why sudden this climate change? My suggestion, who asked you to detonate atom bomb on this earth? That okay. temperature has changed the climate. Nobody wants to listen. We are destroying our own house. Where can human being live other than Earth? There is no oxygen. We those, spend 50 those crores are good in sending it to Mars. Who will live on Mars? There is no oxygen. Sir, those, we have to redesign our DNA if we want to live on this Earth. Thank you. Those are good questions, and I think for the moment, we'll leave it to Trump and Kim to find the answers to them. You have the floor, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Hello. Thank you very much. My name is Mahesh Sagar. I represent, uh, I'm a past president of Rotary Club and uh, <clears throat> run export house with my son. And uh, a very nice discussion. Yes. First of all, I would like to congratulate all of you. My, uh, it's a suggestion or a question. What we need is a water harvesting, you know. Water is the main thing. Water is going down. I was in Italy, 500 rupees a bottle, you know, there, the wife is getting there. So what matters is today, the water is very important, and that is how we can, how we can save water, you know. And that is one sure. suggestion is uh, through harvesting process, you know. In Fine. every house there should be. That's Thank taken you. on board. There's a sustainable development goal devoted to water and how to look at it in a holistic and wholesome manner and entirely. The world is working on that already. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Vijeta and I work with GIZ. My question is to Professor Nicholas Stern. So considering that the architecture of Paris Agreement is, kind, is largely bottom up, what kind of outreach mechanisms and plans are needed to put in place to A, ensure ambition, because a lot of countries are very hesitant to revise their NDCs or open up their NDCs at this stage, and B, to ensure how science can be reflected in the negotiations, as is the central point of the youth activism. This has been a very reassuring session, I would say, because in otherwise dismal scenario, Madam, what you said about four pillars and what Nicholas Stern, whom, from whom I'm learning since the days of his Stern report. And uh, that made me a little different economist than I would have been. I came to ecological economics and Gandhi, and that apart. The question is that uh, the goals have to be reset. Let us get away from this whole, in a way, madness of growth and development. Though I know there is no room for the net growth in the world, but there is a lot of scope for redistribution. Given that, I think that can we, I mean, uh, reframe that the goal should be to build an ecological civilization. The challenge of our time is to build an ecological civilization, and with the less we can do more, and I think time has come where all of our determination, all of our technologies, all of our knowledge of human society can take us. Enough is enough. Thank and you, sir. That enough we is have to give enough. him an opportunity yes, I to know, reply. Nicholas, uh, oh, we'll have to. I mean, it's a wonderful opportunity to hear to him. You have the floor, so sir. So it is a Professor Nicholas. Star. You want to say a comment in uh, return? Uh, 
the lead. Um, thank you. Uh, is this mic working? Or? Yeah, it is. It is? Yeah. So thank you very much for uh, the questions. Uh, if I um, go backwards from the last one and, and then also the one about uh, Paris bottom-up and so on, perhaps leave the others for my fellow panelists since those two were directed at me. Um, the story of growth, redistribution, is there room for more growth? Well, um, and a number of us here are, are wearing the badges of the Sustainable Development Goals, and I think that's a large part of the answer. Surely our goals now are way, way beyond uh, just crude economic growth. I hope they've been that way for quite some time. The Sustainable Development Goals, you know, w which embody redistribution, embody environment, embody uh, gender issues, health, education, and so on, I hope is a, a bigger picture. Is there room for growth? Yes, there is. Um, essentially, if we stop growth today, everywhere, uh, we couldn't, but suppose for this argument that we did, uh, we'd still have the problem. We'd be still be emitting over 50 billion tons of CO2 equivalent a year. What we have to do is to break the relationship between economic and other activity and the damage to the environment. We've got to go net zero. So unless we break that relationship by redesigning, doing things differently, uh, we cannot have growth. We couldn't even sustain it, zero growth. So I think stopping growth isn't actually the big story. The big story is to break its relationship and damage to the environment. And we can see how to do that. And that's what we've uh, been discussing. And keep the sustainable development goals as our cri set of criteria. Um, the uh, UNFCCC process uh, is bottom up. And that's the way it works. Any attempt to impose it top down would uh, get us nowhere. You, there used to be sort of stories of uh, legally binding agreements. Well, how are you going to enforce that? You know, uh, courts from Venus, police force from Mars that were introduced earlier in the discussion. This has to be a bottom up process where people get together, recognize their mutual responsibilities not to damage each other, but also see that there's a very different uh, way forward. Science-based, absolutely, that's where the net zero comes from. And I think by starting <coughs> with net zero, that's the best way to embody uh, science-based targets. And uh, we can look, as it were, to firms and financial institutions, as well as countries, to follow, follow that. That's the way I'd embody the science. The youth are absolutely wonderful. Um, as you can see, I'm not the youngest person in the room. When I was a student in the 1960s, we were angry about uh, Vietnam, we were angry about apartheid, we were angry um, about civil rights, and we were on the right side of history. Um, I, I'm not claiming myself specially, that's what we did, all of us, not all of us, but many of us, the students. Now, the young people are on the right side of history. They're challenging us, they're demanding us. I've been on the platform with 16-year-olds, obviously they were selected 16-year-olds, incredibly well informed, articulate, politically savvy, uh, and making very clear, strong statements and demands. As a university professor, you get older, but they stay the same age, and it's wonderfully invigorating. So I think the way young people have moved over these last few years is uh, enormously uh, exciting and important to the whole story. Uh, thank you, Professor Stern. Uh, climate change is clearly the defining issue of our times, and with COP26 on the horizon, we are at a very pivotal moment to do something about it. Uh, we look forward to a successful COP26 in Glasgow, and I'm sure India would also play a very important uh, role in supporting and seeing that it becomes a success. Uh, with that, I'll bring this session to a close. We have another one to follow. Uh, please give a vigorous round of applause to our, <laughs> our panelists.